joining us. Recording is in progress. We are underway. Um, of course, it's always a little bit of a false start at the beginning, right? Let's just uh, give everybody a moment or two to jump in and join us. We're really grateful that you are here with us today to discuss uh, what voting may look like in 2033 with this tremendous panel. And we're really excited uh, by all of the signups. This is looking like it's going to be one of our largest webinars ever. So thank you again for your support of Fair Vote and for joining us today. And that's why I will uh, just keep talking like this for a couple of more moments at the top, just to be sure that everybody uh, who signed up and is joining us has a moment to get in and get settled before we really get underway. Um, I know it's going to be a great conversation, and I am as excited as all of you for it. Um, so give folks just a couple more moments. Um, and Why not get underway? All right, um, excellent. Thank you uh, again for joining this Fair Vote webinar, what voting may look like in 2033. We have a terrific panel this afternoon. Um, I'm super excited for this conversation. It's the latest webinar in our ongoing series on nonpartisan reforms that can improve the state of American democracy. You can find the others, including discussions with some of the leading experts in the reform world on our YouTube and other social media channels which I would, of course, encourage you to follow if you do not already. I am David Daly. I'm a senior fellow at Fair Vote. I'm the author of two books on democracy and voting rights, Rat F, uh, which my mom doesn't know about, uh, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count, and Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy. I will be your host this afternoon with the honor of putting the first questions to this distinguished group, but we want this to be a conversation, and we're eager to include all of you as well. If you have questions, um, we are all Zoom experts now, right? There is the Q&A box. Go ahead, drop them in there at any time. Um, don't feel like you have to wait for Q&A to begin if you know you have something you want to put to our experts. Um, what I really love about today's topic is that it allows us to be aspirational, to imagine the kind of democracy we want to live in, and then set about building the kind of nation that matches our ideals. Systemic change really is possible at the local, state, and national levels. With a focus on changing winner-take-all elections, our panelists will, escort, excuse me, will discuss the shortcomings of our current systems, give examples of progress that can give all of us hope for the future, and avenues for the kind of structural reform that can finally bring our democratic institutions into the 21st century. We all know, of course, that this is a challenging moment for our republic, but challenging moments can also be an opportunity. We should never let a good crisis go to waste. And what I love about today's panel is that these are idealists and realists, that these are prophets of democracy, but also practitioners who work for change, but have also won real change. Let's meet them. Uh, first, we have Daniel Allen, uh, the political theorist and Washington Post columnist. Danielle is a seasoned nonprofit leader, democracy advocate, national voice on pandemic response, a distinguished author, and a mom. Danielle's work to make the world better for young people has taken her from teaching college and leading a $60 million university division to driving change at the helm of a $6 billion foundation, writing for the Washington Post most recently yesterday with her latest piece on increasing the size of the U.S. House, um, advocating for cannabis, legalization, democracy reform, civic education, and most recently also running for governor here in my state of Massachusetts. During the height of COVID in 2020, Danielle's leadership in rallying coalitions and building solutions resulted in the country's first ever roadmap to pandemic resilience, her policies were adopted in federal legislation and a Biden executive order. Danielle made history as the first Black woman ever to run for statewide office in Massachusetts, continues to advocate for democracy reform to create greater voice and access in our democracy. We are also joined by Ray Lopez Calderon, an activist and strategic 
advisor at More Equitable Democracy, our good friends. Um, he has a wealth of experience in organizational development, fundraising and organizing that he uses to improve the lives of the communities he serves. His activism has taken him from the role of volunteer youth organizer at the United Farm Workers in Orange County to the founding of several community organizations in the Chicago area and to various leadership roles at the government watchdog organization Common Cause, including the refounding executive director of Common Cause Illinois and vice president for development at the DC office where he expanded Common Cause's national fundraising operations. He studied philosophy at the University of Chicago, holds a JD from DePaul College of Law. Uh, when he is not working, he attends uh, Temple Emmanuel and enjoys spending time with his husband and two toy fox terriers in San Diego. We are also joined, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we are also joined by Anthony Ede, uh, a Michigan redistricting reformer and member of the Independent Citizens Commission there uh, as a 28-year-old Chaldean and Lebanese American raised in Southeast Michigan. Um, he affiliates as an independent on the Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission, being a young Middle Eastern uh, Michigander. Commissioner Reed applied for the MICRC for the following reasons to provide a nonpartisan data and evidence-driven approach to redistricting, to provide diversity of thought, culture, and age to the commission, and to create maps that represent the people of Michigan and ensure free and fair elections. Grew up in Orchard Lake before moving to Detroit to pursue higher education, received two bachelor degrees from Wayne State in 2015, and then a master in 2017, has already completed two years of medical school prior to his service on the MICRC and hopes to become an orthopedic surgeon. This is a really tremendous educated uh, uh, panel. There are more degrees here than, uh, it's very impressive. Um, so let me turn this over to all of you as quickly as I can. Let's go with, just with a quick speed round to get ourselves into this uh, very quickly, knowing that we've got the time to get into details here. Um, give me a sense of the one reform each of you think would make the most difference in transforming our democracy by 2033. And Danielle, why don't I start with you? Thank you so much, David. Thank you for opening up this space for this important conversation. And I appreciate just how much you know intensity we all bring to this conversation now. We all are sort of on edge about the health of our democracy. So glad to be here to talk with this amazing group of people. So I put at the top of my list the reform that changes the relationship between primaries and the general election. Um, I'm in favor of replacing party primaries with an all comers preliminary also known as a jungle primary, and taking on a group of finalists to the final round, ideally five finalists, could be four finalists, but shouldn't be fewer than that, and then using instant runoff in that final round to determine the winner. This is also known as the Alaska model. It is what we all just watched in this last go round in Alaska, and of course, Nevada also just approved this method by ballot. Why don't we go Ray, then Anthony? Yeah, um, so... There's a lot of different kinds of reforms, and I, I I don't think that every any one of them is like the perfect you know fit you know bullet silver bullet to fix everything. I think we've had different experiments over time. Um, I think, however, there's a growing body of evidence that uh, ranked choice voting combined with single transferable vote uh, does get to a lot of the outcomes, particularly in representation of, for people of color that we think we we want we want to have. Um, I think it's 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 something that is used in many countries outside of the United States. Um, we have had versions of it in uh, the United States about 100 years ago. We also currently just recently passed um, a version of STV and RCV at in Portland, Oregon. Um, but again, you know, th this we we feel like it's it's the best that we have right now. Anthony. Hello, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be on this esteemed panel. Um, David, your book in particular uh, was one of the reasons I applied to be on the redistricting commission in the first place and was a big, uh, you know, had a very big impact on my life. 
And, you know, I, I agree with the idea that there isn't one shining answer to all of this. It ha has to happen as, in a stepwise process. And often, you know, we try to get it perfect, but uh, we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. I think the most impactful thing we can do is establish more independent redistricting commissions uh, uh, throughout the U.S., whether it be statewide commissions like we have in Michigan or county commissions or citywide commissions, uh, making sure that people have the ability to pick their politicians and not having politicians pick their people, uh, I think can be very transformative. Exciting answer. It's a lot there for us to jump in with. Let's go, we go back to you, Danielle. Uh, you have written about how America is in the middle of a great pulling apart in this series in the Washington Post that you're in the midst of now, but that you also remain hopeful and optimistic that we can come back together and really renovate our democracy. Um, how would you suggest that winner-take-all elections and other structural issues have helped create that uh, pulling apart? Um, why are renovations necessary and what's the source of your optimism? Um, thanks a lot, David. There's a lot in that question, um, for <laughs> sure. So let's just start. You wanted to talk about how are the existing mechanisms helping pull us apart? And the short answer there is we just have too many elections that can be won uh, by somebody sort of capturing an activist sliver of a party base. So in various ways, we have versions of minority rule um, increasing in their impact um, in our society. This blocks a lot of people from having access to voice and choice. At the end of the day, we seek institutions of representation that are fully responsive, and that means inclusive, everybody's got voice and choice, and also effective. So we need both mechanisms that bring everybody into participation, give everybody representation, um, but then also give the people who are elected incentives to be problem solvers and to address our great challenges. So then there's the question, well, what do we need? You said, well, why, why do we need democracy renovation or what does that mean? I think both Anthony and Ray made the point that there is no silver bullet. And I would agree with that. I gave you one answer because you asked for one answer. But <laughs> the truth of the matter here is that the work has to be holistic and it has to be context specific. So some places definitely independent redistricting missions may be exactly the right next step for them. Um, but that won't be true for every single state because our jurisdictional structure is so very different. So my belief is that the single most important thing we all actually need is to be able in place in specific states to ask the question of what top three democracy renovations in this state will do the most to give us that voice and choice for all. Um, ranked choice voting can play a role in a lot of places. Multi-member districts plus ranked choice voting that really make sure that you know the smaller percentages of an elector are also getting a chance to have a representative can also play a role. But we need that context specific holistic strategic analysis. I actually think that's what we most need to achieve democracy renovation. I think that's a really wise answer, recognizing that not only is one, uh, so one solution does not necessarily fit all places and that every state has to think about this given the specific challenges um, to representation there. Um, Ray, we just came through another redistricting process. Uh, they never seem to end uh, these days, but the uh, bulk of the work uh, is done. Um, and certainly the partisans continue to argue about which side came out ahead. But it seems to me that the loser in many parts of the country, um, again, is Danielle uh, talking about the idea of these challenges being different in every state, um, that in many states, the, the loser was the idea of multiracial democracy in a multiracial nation, and that um, we too often saw maps that did not reflect uh, changes in population growth. Um, um, and I wonder how you would like to see redistricting reformed between now and 2033 and how it would work ideally for you in the next cycle uh, in order to uh, take those challenges um, a fair representation on. Thanks, David. Um, I, I should, before I say anything about that, I think we should address a, a potential 
uh, elephant in the room, which is the Supreme Court is very, seems very excited about getting rid of some of the rest of the Voting Rights Act that still exists. Um, that means a lot of what we do currently in redistricting, which is to, to help create sort of majority minority districts, help make sure that minority votes are not diluted, may be under attack uh, or are under attack in the current uh, session. And so that will change everything I'm about to say, <laughs> potentially. Um, and that, uh, and, and honestly, just gives more credence to what uh, Danielle was talking about in terms of finding out creative different ways in different places that are unique to the to the to the local jurisdiction. I think we're going to have a lot of problems if the court does either, you know, strike Section Five of the Voting Rights Act now, or or just starts sort of cutting, chipping away at it a little bit more. Um, there's also another thing going on in Supreme Court that a lot of people don't haven't heard about, which is the fact they're also trying to attack whether or not whether or not a private person can even have standing in that sort of case, which means there's a lot on the on, on the chopping block. But as far as registering as it currently is, um, I think I agree with Anthony in terms of expanding the the number of uh, you know the places where we have more independent redistricting. Um, I think it helps alleviate some of the inherent problems with what you know with with the um, gerrymandering that happens. I should also say it's not just politicians picking their their folks. I think because of the geographic tendencies that uh, particularly people of color have that we end up being segregated into communities or segregated into large urban areas. There's also natural gerrymandering that just happens that is not intentional because of where we're at. And I don't think I think I think that's very difficult to get to with the independent redistricting concept. So we have to think about again local sort of conditions about what what we would do with redistricting. Um, I also think we have to avoid some of the problems that the independent redistricting commissions have had. I think we need to shore up the quality of the independent redistricting commissions. Um, you know, I I live in California. Um, we you know, and I was part of Common Cause. Common Cause you know was really behind uh, the the independent redistricting commission in California. But one of the things we didn't have foresight for was the fact that California's demographics were going to shift so dramatically. Um, you know, the initially we were very much bought into the to the duopoly, right? The the two party system of you know it's Republicans, Democrats, and then it's everybody else, right? And so the idea was to build a commission that had Republicans, Democrats, and a little bit of everybody else. But the, that what's happened in California is Republican the Republican Party has grown as has dropped off in numbers dramatically. It is now actually fewer than independents. So now it's Democrats, independents, and then Republicans. But Republicans have an outsized voice in the Independent Redistricting Commission. So it the way we've structured it here, it isn't able to adapt to shifting demographics. So that could happen, you know, it doesn't matter if there's a 50% Republicans or there's 5% Republicans or Democrats in the state. It they're one of the groups is going to be overrepresented unless there's some kind of dynamic potential to change it. And it's very difficult to change the independent district commission here. Um, that makes someone like me, who is an independent Latino voter, very underrepresented if you look at it from, you know, whether or not it's better for us to have partisan gerrymandering for the Democrats, right? Uh, or it's better to have independence. So I think the I think we have to just do better and do more. Um, the other thing is, is that, you know, the quality does also involves kind of how they're, how the, the independent redistricting commissioners um, uh, do their work. So, for example, uh, one of the good things about the California Redistrict Commission is that we have very strict criteria, very clear criteria about what constitutes a community of interest, for example, or what, how, how our map lines to be drawn, right? Here are, here are guidelines, right? But the opposite of that would be New York State, right? New York had an independent commission that was very vague on the rules. Um, there were multiple problems with, uh, with how that played out. Um, and if you're, you know, it's, I'm not partisan. So, you know, it, it did go badly for the Democrats, but it, even if it hadn't been the Democrats, it doesn't really matter. The fact is that there, it was kind of a free for all. There wasn't clear, clear um, guidelines for them. And, you know, and the other thing is just, you know, there, even with that process, there has to be activist sort of uh, people involved in the process because the maps will be challenged either way. And then, you know, one of the reasons why the Democrats did so poorly was because they didn't participate in the remedial process for the maps when it was when uh, when they had a chance to sort of create alternate maps when the judge struck them down. So 
Uh, I guess I would say that redistricting, it's, it's, you know, right now it's a lot of effort by a lot of community groups and community organizations and civil rights organizations to like get everybody to be in participating. It's very difficult, particularly for groups that are undercounted and just not engaged in the political process. And then on top of that, you have people who have, have interests um, that may or may not align with the majority of the community members. Um, the last thing I'll say is if you look at what what's going on in Los Angeles, um, you know, in LA, we, we, it's even without, you know, even in California where we're very, very conscious about redistricting, you have, you have independent groups or minority groups who are sort of pit against each other in the redistricting process. And I think even with the independent commissions, there is sort of the horse trading and the political stuff that goes on in those commissions. And so it's, you have to find a way also to sort of get, get around that. And um, I don't know, I, I'm not a huge, huge believer that redistricting is going to change everything or fix everything. I think it's more, I often will call it palliative care. <laughs> it really just kind of helps us, helps the wound of, of winner take all elections not fester. I think I know how to, how to unmute myself at this point. Um, the wound of, of winner take all, I like that very much. Um, so what I'm hearing is that we need reforms that are locally driven to meet state and community needs, also reforms that remain flexible um, as, as those needs change. Um, and I'm really excited to bring Anthony into this conversation. Um, because there's really widespread agreement that Michigan was one of the big successes of this last redistricting cycle, that this was one of the independent commissions that truly functioned independently uh, and created state legislative and congressional maps that um, will be responsive to, to, to public opinion um, over the course of the next decade um, in a state where that certainly hasn't always been the case in the past. Um, what are the takeaways and big lessons to be learned from the Michigan process um, as folks think about the next decade? And I'm curious why reform took hold and and worked there, um, but perhaps sputtered elsewhere. Those are those are great questions, and I think it it has a lot to do with who we are in Michigan, right? We're, we're first off, we're we're a purple state. You know, we're not a, a super blue state. We're not a super red state. You know, we voted for, if you go at the top of the ticket, we voted for Obama and then Trump won narrowly and then Biden also won by more than Trump did, but still narrowly. And we've gone back and forth with governors. Um, so so really the, the political makeup in Michigan, uh, you know, flip flops all the time. And I, I think because of that, we were in a situation where a grassroots effort to establish independent redistricting could be rather successful. Uh, Voters Not Politicians is, was the grassroots organization that wrote up the constitutional amendment that was passed in Michigan. Uh, that was passed back in 2018. And um, I think that no matter what side of the aisle you're on, most people, at least in Michigan, can understand, hey, you know, whoever gets the most votes should probably wield the most power. And that's that's not what was going on uh, prior to this past 2022 election. It just it just wasn't. There was an outsized proportion of power being given to a minority of people who got voted for. Um, and most people just inherently in their souls know that that's not a fair system. Um, so that's the first thing. But then going back to the actual constitutional language that was passed, it was very structured. You know, I look at some of these other states, like you don't need to look far. I mean, one state south of Michigan is Ohio, and their redistrict their commission was relatively unsuccessful in passing maps. Uh, and they ended up, you know, still in this past election having a gerrymandered map, and uh, you know, it, the book is still yet to be written on what's going to happen in that state, but it doesn't look good. And then you look at places like Virginia, where they ended up with a relatively fair map, but it was not due to their redistricting commission. It was due to the courts having to get involved. Um, and it, it all goes back to the structure of these commissions. So here in Michigan, we had four Republicans, four independents. I'm sorry, four Republicans, four Democrats, and five independents. Um, 
be members of the commission. They were all regular people that could not have any political affiliation or could not have uh, any family that was involved in the legislature or anything like that. And so we were all just regular everyday folks doing our own thing. And before I was doing it, I was studying in medical school. And um, being able to be that independent where we're not beholden to the legislature, we're not beholden to the Supreme Court of Michigan, uh, really made it so that you know we could try to take a fair evidence and data-based approach to it. Um, whereas, you know, in a place like Virginia, half of their commission was selected by people in power. And whenever you have a situation where members of an independent commission are not truly independent, it's going to create chaos and gridlock. Um, also, we were in a situation where we had to get, uh, that's my cat running through the camera, sorry. <laughs> we, uh, we were in a situation where to pass anything, we had to get votes from two Democrats, two Republicans, and two independents, and then one more to get majority. So that created a situation where there had to be some compromise. Um, I, I drew most of the congressional map that ended up getting passed by uh, my colleagues. And we drew those maps live. And if you watch the, uh, the meetings, you could see you know, concessions had to be made to, to both sides in order to get their votes and come to a compromise in order to pass something fair. So there was never a situation where like the Democrats and independents could team up to pass a Democratic leaning map or the Republicans and the independents could team up to pass a Republican leaning map. Uh, that wasn't the case. We needed votes from all three pools of commissioners. And then finally, in the constitutional language, there was um, a strict priority order of criteria that we needed to follow in order to be successful. The first two of those criteria uh, had to do with federal rules, such as the VRA, one person, one vote, contiguity, things like that. But then you got into um, factors numbers three and four. Three had to do with communities of interest, saying the maps had to reflect our communities of interest in Michigan. It's a very diverse state. We have a very large Middle Eastern community, a very large Hispanic community, and we have the largest Black city in the country. Um, and then criteria four was also a very big one. It guaranteed that our maps had to be proportional uh, and not favor one party or another. And those, th those two criteria were ranked higher on our list than some of the more um, usual criteria like county boundaries, city boundaries, um, or factoring in incumbency or compactness. The fact that communities of interest and proportionality was higher gave us more leeway in order to really make the maps as fair as we could. So I, I really do think it comes down to structure um, and having these commissions structured in a way that they're strong and can, uh, you know, can make the change. Even if we, yeah. let's say now, you know, after we were done, this is kind of funny. I always said if uh, if we make everybody a little bit unhappy, we probably did something right. And we ended up being sued by both Republicans and Democrats. So that kind of tells you where, where we were at. But um, let's say a court were to strike down our maps. There's never a situation where the court would draw the map or the legislature would draw the map. Um, if our maps are to be struck down, it would come back to our commission and we would have to redraw them. Uh, at least right now, you know, there's another Supreme Court case, Moore v. Harper, that could really uh, screw things up. Ray, you were talking about Supreme Court cases, and that's the one I'm a little worried about. But being able to maintain independence, I think, is important for these type of initiatives and commissions. Incentivizing a process that mirrors what we hope we might see in our politics of uh, folks working together and finding consensus and common ground um, seems like a a positive approach. Um, maybe someday we'll see that out of the U.S. Supreme Court, right? Um, gosh, we can hope. Um, and I think you get a special thrill in Michigan out of uh, uh, tweaking the the, the uh, failures in Ohio. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just saying. Maybe that is a competition that continues um, from the gridiron to gerrymandering. Um, Go blue. <laughs> um, 
Before we get into the next round of questions, let me just remind you all that uh, the Q&A field is open for your questions. I see a number of good ones in there already, uh, so go ahead and keep filling that up. We'll get to them um, pretty quickly. Um, um, but I get to I put another one to, to each of these, these um, terrific experts uh, first. Um, um, let me go back to you, Danielle. Uh, the, the Our Common Purpose report from the American Academy uh, was such a terrific uh, look at where American democracy might go. Um, I wonder if you might walk through um, some of the main recommendations, particularly around the House and around RCV and moving away from this notion of winner-take-all elections, um, and describe how that might make a difference um, in in rebuilding uh, the institutions of our democracy for the 21st century. Well, so thank you, David. The Our Common Purpose Report was put out by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in June of 2020. It was the work of a commission, a national commission sponsored by the Academy that ran for several years. It was a cross ideological commission. So members came from really different parts of the political spectrum from across geographies, across backgrounds, um, racial and ethnic, and across professional sectors. And we spent quite a lot of time talking to people around the country about challenges to our democracy, areas of frustration, and probing people for solutions. It's very clear that we are in a kind of what an economist would call a negative equilibrium. We have unresponsive political institutions that demotivate people from participation. And that means people aren't participating in civic society, civil society organizations, and then our sort of civic culture erodes. We lose our sense of commitment and connection to each other and to our constitutional democracy. So the hard challenge, if we're thinking about 2033 and we're trying to get, is really like flip the switch, flip the equilibrium from a negative one to a positive one. In the positive equilibrium, you'd have a, a virtuous circle with those you know, responsive political institutions, um, inspiring participation, fueled by civic associations that are helping people bridge difference and where that participation and engagement is nourishing and sustaining a civic culture that supports that shared sense of connection and commitment to our constitutional democracy. So that's sort of the big conceptual vision of the report. And I like to lay that out because it's just important again to remember that the work on democracy is holistic. We know there isn't a silver bullet. So, you know, you're really interested in the question of proportional representation and where that fits into the picture here. And one of the re recommendations in the report um, was really an endorsement of the Fair Representation Act. This is an act that um, would have congressional districts become multi-member districts. And then where those uh, multiple members in a district, say three members in a district, would be elected um, by a form of ranked choice voting. And the, there are several beauties to this idea. One is that it is gerrymander proof. So no longer would we need to worry about redistricting and independent redistricting commissions. It's just, it just literally cannot be gerrymandered. The result would be that you'd see, uh, you know, the sort of population represented in its little cluster of representatives proportionally to the spread of opinion, whether that is party opinion or the spread of opinion that comes from different cultural groups within um, a community, whether that's racial groups or maybe an urban rural divide and the like. Um, so that is, you know, a real difference from our current system. Now, I will admit, I, I do find, and I know people are tired of hearing me say this, I find the sort of beyond winner take all language a little challenging because, you know, we, we have, that's a sort of phrase that makes sense at the congressional level only when we're talking about parties, all right? But most of us actually have a candidate-centric way of thinking about elections. And so it's not a vocabulary that helps us think about how things would be different for those of us who are really focused on which candidates get elected. So I really do prefer to talk about this mechanism as one that gives voice and choice to all voters. So you get a greater diversity of choices in terms of the candidates who are available. And voters of a variety of different kinds of backgrounds um, have a much higher probability of seeing a person that they feel represented by coming out the end of this process. Um, it also has the interesting effect of meaning that, um, you know, in Congress, for instance, um, when one party caucuses, they would have geographic representation from the whole country in their caucus. You wouldn't have, you know, be unlikely to have a pure blue district or a pure red district um, and so forth. So. But I guess I just really want to underscore that I really do honestly think that we need a vocabulary 
that responds to and recognizes that we are fundamentally a candidate centric democracy, not a party centric democracy for all of the power of parties. And I think we're really sort of stuck on that kind of contrast between the power of the parties and what our actual kind of cultural DNA is for thinking about elections. Thank you. Um, Ray, um, you raised the issue of the Supreme Court earlier. Um, so I'm going to also come back to you now uh, to, in some ways, take the opposite side of this. Danielle has laid out an image um, and a vision of where democracy can go with some common sense reforms. Um, and I wonder if you might um, give us your sense of what happens if we fail to move toward reforms like these? Um, what are your concerns about what the country could look like in 2033 without the kinds of reforms that we're talking about here today? Well, I, I hesitate to answer this question because I don't want to bum everyone out on the call. But um, I think we've seen what it looks like uh, in the past where we had very you know, different types of elections before the Voting Rights Act. I mean, we've seen uh, even just when, uh, like, say, for example, the, the Voting Rights Act, uh, the Shelby case that um, I think it was 2013, they, they gutted the uh, preclearance part of, of the Voting Rights Act. And what we saw was an immediate, you know, sort of flurry of, of states and local jurisdictions, anywhere from, you know, states in the South to like Pasadena, California, where they were trying to block Latinos. Um, change the voting process, right? Change, just uh, close down. There was hundreds and hundreds of closures in some states, and particularly in Georgia, where they closed down polling, right? So I think what, what we're going to see without fundamental changes is a regime that is very anti-minority. Uh, um, and I think, you know, I, I use the term winner take all, but I, I, I take Daniel's point, uh, Danielle's point as well, that, you know, I, I, I don't think people even think about the election system at all sometimes I think they just feel like it's not for them and I feel like any and if we don't change something now it's going to get worse and worse and I think if we don't you know pay attention to what's happening in, in communities um I I didn't my background wasn't originally in democracy reform I come out of very grassroots community organizing right I was a community organizer in in Chicago for at least 15 years, uh, worked on the south side of Chicago, worked with poor people, immigrants, uh, largely people of color, but, but even poor, like white, you know, Eastern European immigrants who were trying to make it in America. And those folks, you know, their their existence and their and the stuff that people are dealing with every day are 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 really intense. Like, am I going to be able to feed my family, right? Am I going to have, are we going to have a home next week, right? It, to that, so that sort of difficulty and the sort of the vast inequalities in America are always simmering, right? They're always right there ready to explode. Um, you know, I grew up, I grew up in the shadow of the Rodney King riots in, in LA. Um, we just saw recently things that have, the thing that happened, well, with George Floyd and among other things. Um, honestly, if we don't do something I think those things will continue to to explode. I think people will be will be taken to the streets. Um, I know that in 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 my community, you know, there are folks who feel that they are completely not represented by any party whatsoever, right? So, and it's not just that they're not party centered; it's just like they feel the parties take advantage of them or they ignore them. Uh, alternately, um, and I think I think those things are going to keep getting getting more intense over time especially if these changes that I think that might happen in the Supreme Court ha happen. Um, I'm going to spin this a little bit positive because I don't want to leave it on that tone. Um, one of the things that I think has happened since 2016 is that because there was such a, a an attack, like a direct attack on democracy in many ways, particularly in for the 2020 election, right, with democracy deniers and all these other things, I think because there's been this sustained sort of attack. Um, I, I've actually seen more people participate in democracy than I've ever seen, I think, in my entire career, and I'm getting old. Um, I used to tease an organization I was at, the, I used to tease the board and told them they had a fiduciary duty to support President Trump because he was 
angering so many people that people were actually getting off their butt to do stuff, right? People were giving money, people were in, in much bigger amounts than they used to give. So I feel like it, I think it's going to get dark if we don't change, make these changes. It can get even darker if the Supreme Court does what I think it might do. But I always, I do believe in the people. And I do believe that that sort of level of in-your-face discrimination, you know, I, I imagine that the maps are going to change, you know, as soon as they can not have to deal with my majority minority districts, everyone's, people are going to change those things so that they can make it to their advantage. Um, and I think once we get there, I think people will see, hey, we, this isn't, we, we no longer, this is not even fixable. We have to do something completely radically different. And I think that's where the reforms that we're talking about come into play. And then unfortunately, we may have to get to that level for us to do it in a very, very large way. Um, and, and I will say that there are people who are at least ahead of the curve right now who are not waiting just to react to those things, but are actually pushed, you know, D D Danielle's one of them, Anthony's one of them. There are people out there who are actually passing the reforms, right? You know, uh, with MED, we, you know, spent five years planning to, to pass STV, RCV uh, version in Portland investing. And so I think, I think the people, there are people, but more people have to get involved in planning the future. Anthony, my next question for you also mimics one that uh, Charles Bailey uh, uh, put in our in our Q and A. And Charles uh, congratulates you all for the success of the IRC in Michigan. Uh, and he's wondering if there's if there's any need now or later in Michigan uh, for ranked choice voting or single transferable voting reforms. Um, and I mean, certainly, I think if there's if there's something that um, has been a criticism of the of the uh, maps there, probably one that we'd in many ways agree on. Uh, it's 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 what happened to uh, black representation in in Congress, particularly as you mentioned, out of Detroit, the uh, city with the largest uh, uh, black percentage population in, in the country. So I wonder if you've looked at uh, or or thought about um, uh, fixes and 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 other reforms there that. Uh, might be built in on top of a commission. Well, I, you know, I agree with that. I think it is a, it's a complicated issue in Michigan. You know, we, we're in a situation where we created majority minority districts, but they weren't majority black districts uh, because we did a, a study uh, through, uh, you know, nationally known experts. And the, the results of that study were that there was enough crossover voting so that having majority black districts, actually that is what would dilute um, the voice of, of black people in Southeast Michigan. And also in regards to the last census, um, a lot of black folks moved from Detroit to the suburbs. Um, but even with all that, we went from um, two minority members of Congress and 14 seats to the current delegation, which is three minority members of Congress with only 13 seats. And um, in the Michigan constitution, we couldn't take incumbency into effect. So we didn't uh, into account when drawing the maps. And uh, I think it was a surprise to pretty much everybody um, when Brenda Lawrence retired. Um, I think if she would have ran, she very easily would have won the district that Sri Tanadar ended up winning. Um, and it, it's also interesting because uh, there is still a, a black member of the Michigan delegation. It's just they're in the Macomb County district instead of the Detroit district. And they're on the Republican side of the aisle. So, you know, it gets into factors of like, what is a candidate of choice? Because um, both Rashida Tlaib and Sri Tanadar in their primaries did get um, the most votes from the Black population, but in District 13 in particular with Sri Tanadar, there were so many Black candidates that they cannibalized on each other. Um, you had, you know, Sri Tanadar got about 22,000 votes, Adam Hoyer, um, Adam Olier, sorry, got about 18,000, and Patricia Robinson got about 13,000, and then you had you know, another seven candidates or so knock off a few percentages here or there. Um, so there, there are really two options to solve this, right? Either the community can come together and rally around 
um, a fewer number of candidates so that they don't cannibalize on each other, which most likely would result in um, someone who is African American winning that primary. And if you win that primary, you're almost guaranteed to win in the general. Um, you know, it's funny we have a uh, we have an open Senate seat now that uh, uh, Senator Stabenow is retiring and. Most of the potential candidates have already said they're not going to run for it. And I'm wondering, like, who's doing this? Why can't why can't we had these kind of, uh, you know, talks between candidates in Detroit to to whittle down the pool before the primary happened? Um, I think that would be a solution. But if but it didn't happen at the end of the day, there was this primary where you had Sri Tanadar, the only um, he, he is a minority member, but uh, he is not a black member. And the biggest black city in the country uh, and having fewer candidates in the primary probably would have changed that so another thing that could change that is ranked choice voting now i've been speaking to folks around the detroit area about making that a reality and i think in detroit in particular uh would be an optimal place to institute ranked choice voting because that also would solve this issue you know i, I would suspect there are quite a lot of vo voters that either put Adam Ollier or Patricia Robinson first, and their second choice would have been the other. And perhaps their third or fourth choice probably was Sri Tanadar. Um, so that is certainly one potential way to uh, fix that issue. And I think, you know, Michigan, the, the next big reform uh, could certainly be ranked choice voting, and I would be totally in support of that. Why don't we move on to some questions from all of you? Um, if you've got some, feel free to keep adding them into the Q&A field uh, down at the bottom on Zoom. Uh, I know Danielle has to leave us uh, just a little bit before the bottom of the hour. So um, I'm going to try to throw the first couple in your direction. Um, there's, there's one from Zachary Weinstein asking if you can talk more about the jungle primary with RCV uh, in the general re reform that you mentioned at the start um, and some other questions kind of um, asking if you could clarify how that would work and who would, would move on. Um, if you have um, an answer to that, sure. that would be great, yeah. Okay, well, um, so first of all, let's talk about that, what I like to call all coverage preliminary. Some people call it jungle primary. We should avoid calling it an open primary because that is a phrase that means several different things is it just confuses the conversation, okay? So for example, in my home state, we have quote, unquote, open primaries, which means if you're an independent, you can pick which party primary to vote in. Now, when you have those party primaries like that that are run by the state, you got to recognize that what's happening is the state is funding the existence of the parties, regardless of how healthy the parties are. All right, because that's what it means for the state to run those party primary elections. So switch to a preliminary for all comers, regardless of candidates' party affiliation. Parties can do, still do their thing. They can have conventions. They can endorse candidates. Somebody can go on the ballot as the endorsed Democrat, the endorsed Republican, the endorsed Green, the endorsed whatever else you might want to have or might make it through. Parties have to be responsible for their own organization for building up that you know power and effect and so forth to do that without being paid by the state to have the sort of support for that. All right, so that's an all comers preliminary. It's not nonpartisan in the sense that people can still run with their partisan labels. It's just that it, the election is not run by the parties. That's the really important thing about it, okay? It's run by the state for the whole general electorate. And so candidates have to campaign to the whole general electorate, even in that first round point. You use plurality voting to take on your finalists. Why use plurality voting there? To keep the, the, the frame open as wide as possible, as much diversity as possible. So you're getting all the different sort of chunks of opinion that are really flowing into the electorate. You don't need it to be a majority at that point because you're trying to maximize the choice set. All right, so you take four or five on to maximize the choice set to the general election or the final round, you could also call it. And four or five, you know, those are cognitively sort of maximum numbers. More than that, it's too much choice for people. But we're a really diverse society now. So we want to actually open the aperture. We want more voices in there on that choice list. So that's why I go for five rather than four. You think there's not that much in it, but it's like that much more diversity that you get in terms of the public debate, discussions, and so forth. 
And then yes, you do you do instant runoff form of RCV for that final election because you want somebody to get over that 50% threshold. Uh, you want to avoid a problem where you have, for example, a majority Republican district and so many Republicans run that the one Democrat who gets through sort of wins as on a plurality vote, which would not really be fair to all those other voters or vice versa. You could tell the story the other way as well. So you use instant runoff to make sure that somebody has to get over that majority threshold um, in the final round. But again, so in both those moments, people are campaigning to the general electorate. And in that, especially the final round piece, they've got to be coalition builders. And so you have those positive incentives for politicians and positive incentives for elected officials. It's really a kind of transformative electoral mechanism. There's a lot of power in it. There's a lot of questions here as well about um, about civic education. Um, and I know that's an important piece of the Our Common Purpose report as well. I wonder if you might just, um, because I, I think we're also not going to uh, get to any of the big structural reforms that we hope to see and believe the country needs so badly without being able to have a, a trusted conversation and um, um, and everybody, everybody, everybody thinking about about civics in a in a in a fair and nonpartisan way. Um, I wonder, Danielle, how we ought to be thinking about civic education in a, a moment as polarized as this. Well, I'm happy to jump in on that since I'm headed from this directly to a conversation about civic <laughs> education. So these are my twin passions. Um, I also just want to acknowledge the, the comment, why I use the term jungle primary? It sounds awful. I agree, which is why I don't use it. It's just that some people know what that is. So, but all comers preliminary. Okay. Then I'm trying to like really get that phrase out there. All comers preliminary. That's what we need, you know, run by the state, not by parties. Civic education. Yes. There's another beautiful report. It's called Educating for American Democracy. This one came out in March, 2021. Um, and it would be great if we could um, put this um, in the chat for folks. Um, I put the Our Common Purpose report in one of the Q&A answers. Uh, this was also a big cross-sector, cross-ideological coalition, 300 educators, scholars, and practitioners around the country, funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities, the U.S. Department of Education. I think we are probably the only project funded by both the Trump and the Biden administration. So that tells you that we can get things done and keep things happening even in polarized times. It is a roadmap for rebuilding excellence in history and civic learning for all learners. Check it out. There's ways to get involved on that roadmap and pay attention to the Civics Secures Democracy Act in Congress, which would fund the kind of efforts represented by the Educating for American Democracy roadmap. Thank you. Um, Thank you, and I apologize for disappearing early, but great to be with you. Not a problem all. at all. We really appreciate your joining us. Um, let me throw the, the same question of civic op education over to both of you, because I mean, I I really do agree that without a way for all of us to be talking on the same page at a time when oftentimes these reform issues, democracy issues itself, become partisan, how do we avoid these questions of being partisan and actually get to uh, a place where we can talk about how we make representation better for all Americans. Either one of you want yeah, to jump I'll, on that first? Yeah, I'll take that on. And right. you know, Ray, Ray kind of mentioned it yeah. earlier with, you know, things might get a little worse before they get better. And as I don't know how young I am anymore. I turned 30 not too long ago, but as a relatively young person in this space, um, you know, I, I have seen a lot of apathy from young people when it comes to the political process. Uh, certainly, you know, after, you know, certainly at the end of the 2020s, um, especially during that time, there were so many young people who just didn't want to be a part of the political process. They felt like their vote didn't matter. They weren't very well educated on the things going on in the world. Um, and, and that, it, it starts from a young age, I think. You know, we really have to increase the amount of education available on, you know, from middle school and high school on how our government works. You know, I heard, of, I first learned about gerrymandering in, in high school, but I went to a relatively good high school uh, West Bloomfield High School in, in Orchard Lake in West Bloomfield, Michigan. But 
And I remember when I was in college and I had to take a, a, uh, an American government class and something like gerrymandering or ranked choice voting or any of these initiatives we're talking about today were never mentioned. And I think that's a problem. You know, we have to be more proactive in our learning. Um, and especially in this divided time that we're in where there's a rampant amount of misinformation, there's a rampant amount of attacks on education, uh, we need to combat it. And I think it's starting to change. I think in the past two years or so, you know, young people especially are starting to pay more attention and get more involved in the political process. There's some real, um, we saw some real energy from young people in the 2022 election. And uh, that was nice to see. And we need to, we really need to continue it because that's the next, you know, it's the next generation that's going to be not only voting, but eventually running for office and making some of these decisions. Um, so, you know, education is extremely important. Uh, and, and also, you know, I, I think we do need to do a better job of teaching critical thinking, you know, a more of an evidence-based education, how to look at data, how to tell uh, what is a good source of information versus a bad source of information. Because with social media, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, uh, especially I'll mention TikTok again, because my little sister's on there and she's 24. And uh, there, there's just so much misinformation that happens on these platforms. And a lot of people just don't know how to figure out what's real and what's not. Ray, uh, let me try to combine a couple of the questions I, I see here in one as we're running out of time. Um, there's, there's, there, there's a question about um, the importance of attainability in winning a reform in a local state. There's a question about the main obstacles to reform. And I think both of those can probably be um, put together um, into, into your sense of really of how we win, it seems to me to, to, to be the, the actual question there. Sure. I, I'm assuming by attainability, uh, the person means what we used to call winnability in the Win organizing community. Um, so here, here's here's the problem with the whole question there. And I think this is because people generally frame winnability or attainability by, you know, what are the things already in place that we can take advantage of right now? And then the assumption is that you know, we could do incremental change, right? Incremental change is possible, but only if we take advantage of what's acceptable now. I think there's a place for that. And there in, you know, I, I was, when I was a lobbyist, right? And I had to lobby the legislature. There were relationships sometimes where I think we could immediately quickly pass something that would at least get people engaged in an issue. Um, the problem with that is that sometimes there, because there's so much energy in the public's mind to make to to support that sort of incremental attainable effort that it's hard to actually come back once you did that right because maybe you, you you did it partially with the idea that you'll 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 add on to it later and then you never get back to it later or it's very difficult to go back to the legislators who you sort of connected with to make the 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 uh, the first win possible um, they're not ready. They're not. They look. We just did this last year, right? We just did this. Why should we? You know, now you know we did RCV. Why do you want STV now? Like we like. I thought RCV was going to fix everything, and so I think it can cause that problem. So, um, so so you know, it may be helpful, but it also may handicap you for a while to be able to do anything further. Um, I I also think that, and this is a, a good example of what happened in Portland, Oregon. I also think that if you really work with people in communities, and you actually have leadership coming from communities rather than even organizations like ours, right? Or even like, um, you know, uh, political parties or, or anybody, you're actually coming up from communities. Communities will often be, come to reasonable ideas. And if people are part of the process of saying, hey, we, what should we implement locally? Like Danielle talked a lot about, you know, local jurisdictions figuring out what was good for them, but actually working with people in the communities, not just elite educated people or lawyers and, and I'm bashing myself of course but um the that they came up with a, a package of things that were radically different than anybody would have thought was attainable right so there were in fact was, was a very clear uh, movement in Oregon to just do ranked choice voting without STV and that was going to be 
because that was what was attainable. That's what it's, you know, all the sort of political operators felt that that was something that could be doable and they would go back to it. But the community said, no, that's not going to achieve the purposes that we're looking at. We want representation for minorities, for people of color. We're spread out all over the place. This is not going to help us in that. And so the community came up with their reform, ran the reform, and won their reform. So I think the attainability frame sometimes is uh, oppressive to what's really possible, right? And I think I think that goes back to the civic education point, which is if people are given problems, right, uh, they often will come up to this, you know come up with the solutions. I mean, um, the paraphrasing a famous Malcolm X quote, right? But um, I, I feel like I feel like attainability, and it's just it's just it's it's only for very very narrow purposes. I think if you're really doing civic education, if you're really doing serious organizing, people will people will come up with much better. And and I don't have the study in front of me, and maybe Fairboat has it, but there was also some a lot of polling done in the last few years about would people rather support individual sort of reforms or would they support a package of reforms? And it seems like almost always people support the larger package of reforms. And so you might have way more support for that than you think you have. We dream big. That's what we do in this, in this, in this space is dream big and then go out and make it real. Um, um, so I want to thank you for ending today on that really optimistic note. Uh, this has been a terrific group. Um, I, sorry, we didn't get to all of these great questions in the time we had we will do our best to try and get you s s some answers uh we have your emails uh with your registration so we will do everything we can um let me encourage you to follow our terrific panel on uh on on twitter um and make twitter a a better place right and not a place of uh of misinformation uh go out and get the real stuff from Ray at Ray LC, from Danielle Allen at D Salentis, D S A L L E N T E S S, and Anthony at, at A N T H E I D. Um, thank you again to all of you for joining us today to talk about what voting can look like in 2033. Thank you for uh, joining us to learn from this terrific panel. Thank you to the terrific panel. Uh, keep an eye out in your emails for invitations to future webinars. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Thanks again for joining us today.